Chapter 2 of Living Time by Maurice Nicole Quality of Consciousness There is little doubt that we take our consciousness for granted in much the same way as we take the world as we see it for granted. Our consciousness seems final. It seems the only kind of consciousness that we can possibly know. While we may doubt our memory or even our powers of thought and sometimes our feelings, we would scarcely think of doubting our consciousness. We would never regard it as something that makes our life what it is. The fact, for example, that our experience seems divided into opposites, into black and white, into yes or no, into contradictions, would not seem to us to be due to the nature of our consciousness or to the kind of mind we have, which is a direct result of our degree of consciousness but to something inherent in external things themselves. Through some experiences and through experiments made on himself, William James concluded that, start quote, our normal waking consciousness, rational consciousness, is but one special type of consciousness, while all about it, parted from it by the flimsiest of screens, there are potential forms of consciousness entirely different, end quote. Convinced of the existence of other states of consciousness through which we experience things in quite a new way and through which we meet life in a new way, he realised that no account of the universe can ever be regarded as final which leaves out these other forms of consciousness. Nor can any view of ourselves be final if we accept that our present consciousness is final. Consciousness is usually defined as awareness, but this definition is actually inferior in meaning to the implication of the word itself. Consciousness means, literally, knowing together. A development of consciousness would therefore mean knowing more together, and so it would bring about a new relationship to everything previously known. For to know more always means to see things differently. But even if we take consciousness merely as meaning awareness, we cannot imagine that it is all possible awareness. It must be a degree of awareness and one through which we are related in a particular way to whatever we know. Our ordinary consciousness relates us to ourselves and to things. During the sleep, the quality of our consciousness is changed. It gives one a sort of awareness and relation. When we awake, the degree of awareness and the form of relation is changed. But though we may admit the truth of this, we do not think that still further kinds of consciousness may be possible, giving new degrees of awareness and relation. Nor do we think that many of our insoluble difficulties, perplexities and unanswered questions necessarily exist because of the kind of consciousness we naturally possess and that a new degree of consciousness would either cause our awareness of them to disappear or bring about an entirely new relation to them. Consciousness is sometimes compared with light. An increase of consciousness is likened to an increase of light. But we shall see eventually that an increase of consciousness does not mean only that we see with greater clearness which what was formerly obscure. The quality is changed. For the moment, the man who experiences it himself is changed. It is not merely the quantity of consciousness that is altered, but its very nature. What evidence is there from the physiological side about levels of consciousness in man? What does neurological teaching say? In his teaching about the nervous system, Hewlings Jackson, the forerunner of English neurology, conceived it as an integrated system of nervous levels in which the higher holds the lower in check. We must understand that the nervous system is not one thing or of one comp composition, a uniformity. It is a structure of different groupings of nerve cells fitted together and linked up on the principle of scowl and apparently preceded over by the cortex of the brain which itself shows different strata or levels of nerve cells. Jackson taught that if the action of a higher level in the nervous system is weakened, the activity of a lower level is released. 
a lower function takes the place of a higher function. The main point he emphasised was that we could never understand the action of the nervous system, physiologically considered, unless we took into review this factor of release, because many symptoms of disordered nervous function consist in phenomena of release. It is necessary to understand clearly what he meant. Imagine a schoolmaster in charge of a class of boys, and suppose that the schoolmaster represents a higher level, the boys are lower, and that the whole class constitutes an integrated system, which works in a certain way. If the schoolmaster goes to sleep, the lower level is released, that is, the boys begin to behave as they like, and the system now works in quite a different way. This is due not merely to the fact that the schoolmaster is asleep, which Jackson would have called a negative factor, that is, it does not itself give rise to any manifestations or symptoms, but rather to the release of the boys from control with resulting disorder. In other words, if a higher level of the nervous system is not working, its absence of function cannot be discerned in itself. It will only be the released activity of the lower level that will be manifested, and this only can be studied. The function of the higher level will merely be absent and it will be impossible to deduce its nature because we will only be able to perceive and study the released activities of a lower level. Suppose that the schoolmaster becomes invisible when he falls asleep and that we know nothing about the proper working of a class. We see only a number of boys in a state of disorder. We can deduce nothing about the proper working of the class from this disorder. It will remain unknown to us. In the absence of higher function, lower function necessarily appears, and this latter is of a different order. The higher function cannot be deduced from the lower. If we think of the question from the standpoint of levels of consciousness, then beneath our ordinary level exists a lower level of another order. When the level of ordinary consciousness is disturbed, Jackson observed that there is often a marked rise of dreamlike states, which he ascribed to the release of the activities of a lower level. Another quality of consciousness manifests itself, for at this level things can be connected together in a way that is impossible at the usual level, and we are exposed to fantastic influences, nightmares, etc., which do not exist at the higher level. When there are very remarkable contradictions in the personality, this dream state has a tendency to arise at any time and interfere with the life. We have no right to believe that our ordinary level of consciousness is the highest form of consciousness, or the sole mode of experience possible to man. We cannot say that the range of the internal experience of oneself is necessarily limited either to dream states or to ordinary consciousness. We have to consider the possibility not only that there is a level above our ordinary level of consciousness to which we are only occasionally awakened, but that our ordinary consciousness becomes integrated into a larger system when this happens. From this point of view, our ordinary consciousness would have to be regarded as a release phenomenon. We would have to study ourselves from the angle of being disintegrated and not integrated individuals. From the physiological standpoint, what can be said in respect to evidence is that the nervous system seems certainly far from being fully used under ordinary conditions. But this kind of evidence, clinically speaking, is not easy to marshal. It is necessary to approach the subject from the psychological side. There is a very old idea that man cannot find any integration or harmony of being as long as he is on the level of a sensual outlook. As a creature of sense, thinking only from sense and turned outwards towards visible life, he remains dead in regard to that which is himself. Nor is he quickened by any dem demonstration coming from the sensible side of the universe. In the older views of man, which were much richer and more complete than are the modern views, man was placed in the framework of a vast living universe as a created being, that is, created in and out of the living universe. 
So not only was man in the world, but the world was in him. The idea of scow or degree of excellence permeated most of the older notions about man and the universe. The universe is on different scows, and man was taken as a very complex creation having within him a scow consisting of different levels of mind, consciousness and understanding. Of these levels, the sensual was taken as the lowest. I will connect the sensual with the materialistic outlook of today. The point to be noticed is that if there be potential degrees of development hidden as a scow within man, no one can rise in this scow of his own potential being unless he transcends the purely sensual or material outlook. The psychological implications behind this view are really of very great interest and importance. A sensualistic or materialistic outlook limits us psychologically in the fullest sense of this word, so that if there be higher degrees of consciousness, we will be incapable of reaching them only if we believe in the evidence of things seen or seek only for proof from the visible, tangible and matter-of-fact side of things or regard the world simply as we see it. What is the standpoint of materialism? It is not by any means so easy to define as we may think. We are materialists without knowing it, and materialism is a much deeper problem to each of us than we imagine. But, in the first place, from its standpoint, we look outwards, via the senses, for the explanation and cause of everything. We start from phenomena as absolute truth. Speaking first of ultimate issues, we seek proof of the existence of God from phenomenal life itself. If life takes on an evil aspect, we think there can be no God. Scientifically, we seek for causes in the phenomenal world. In both cases, we are doing much the same thing. In the first case, we are looking for spirit in visible material life. In the second case, we are looking for the principles behind phenomena in the minutest forms of matter. As materialists, we look for cause in the elementary material particle. We look for the final explanation of the mystery of life in minute physiological processes, in biochemistry, etc. We might compare this with looking for the causes of a house only in its minute structure, as if we could find its real cause in the elementary bricks of which it is composed, and not in the idea behind it. For, to materialists, the world must necessarily be idealless. It can be no masterpiece of art, for where is the artist? Neither telescope nor microscope reveal his actual existence. If the originating principle behind all manifestation is not in the phenomenal world itself, if it lies in idea working via chemistry, that is, through minute elementary particles, into visible form, we must, as materialists, ignore this factor and assume that the chemical processes belonging to the world of atoms themselves establish life. The development of the germ cell into an embryo is, from this side, merely a progressive series of chemical changes, starting from the initial shock of conception, each chemical change determined by and following upon the previous one, and thus leading to the building up of the embryo. Looking only at the chemical changes, we will ignore the controlling principle or law acting behind them. Whatever we do not find in the three dimensions of space, we will ignore, not seeing life as unfolding events, but rather as aggregations of physical mass. Strictly speaking, materialism gives sense and physical matter priority over mind or idea. In the tenth book of the Laws, Plato put the standpoint of materialism, as it existed then, clearly enough. The materialist was a person who regarded nature as self-derived. Elementary particles of dead matter somehow or other combined together to form the entire universe and all the living beings contained in it. 
Matter accidentally raised itself up into the most complex living forms. Matter created its laws. And mind itself resulted from these accidental combinations of inanimate matter. We've got a quote here from The Laws by Plato. They say that fire and water and earth and air all exist by nature and chance. The elements are severally moved by chance and some inherent force according to certain affinities, among them of hot with cold or of dry with moist, etc. After this fashion and in this manner, the whole heaven has been created as well as animals and plants, not by the action of mind, as they say, or of any god, but as I was saying, by nature and chance only. End quote. From this standpoint, physical nature is necessarily the first cause of the generation and destruction of all things. Mind is secondary, an accidental product of physical matter. Can we really believe that mind and intelligence accidentally came out of dead matter? If so, then in order to face the problem sincerely, we must grant to original matter, which chemically speaking is hydrogen, extraordinary properties and assume that all organised beings were potentially present in the first matter of the nebula system. That is, if we believe that the universe started at some distant point in passing time. But the customary standpoint of scientific materialism is that primary matter is dead and the universe is dead and nature is dead and a dead nature can, of course, aim at nothing. It cannot be teleological. Since Plato's time, science has passed far beyond the region of the unaided senses. It has turned matter into electricity and the world of three dimensions into a theoretical world of at least four dimensions. It has passed beyond natural, i.e. sensual concepts, beyond the visualisable and matter-of-fact. Physicists today are trying to understand what we are in. What is this world view in which events happen? Does one event really cause another? What is this four-dimensional continuum called space-time? And what, for the matter, is electricity? We are in a mysterious and incomprehensible universe. Nevertheless, Psychologically speaking, the standpoint of materialism prevails and spreads its effects over the entire world. How can we better grasp what materialism consists in as regards its psychological effect? Why can it limit us psychologically? Let us glance at an entirely different standpoint. The platonic view of visible or phenomenal reality was that there is behind it an invisible and greater order of reality. There is invisible form or figure, only mentally perceptible, over and above all form and figure that we can apprehend through our senses. These invisible forms or figures with which our term idea came to be connected are prior in scale to, and therefore much more real than any perceptible form or figure. Thus the world of sense all that we see is a very limited expression of real form and, properly speaking, science studies that which is indicated in the visible object. And a quote here from Burnett's Platonism, page 43, 1928. The object of anything that can be called science in the strict sense of the word is something that may be indicated by the world of sense, but it is not really of that world but of a higher degree of reality." End quote. The geometer, for example, studies triangles and finds that the three interior angles of any sort of triangle are always equal in sum to two right angles. But this is not true of any triangle that we, we can perceive with the external senses because it is not possible to draw an absolutely exact triangle. So the triangle itself belongs to a higher degree of reality than any visible representation of it. The triangle as idea, the ideal triangle, does not exist in passing time and space. It is not visible, but is only apprehended by the mind. In a similar way, anything that has the semblance of beauty, relation and proportion in the visible world 
as seen by us with our organs of sight, has behind it beauty, relation, and proportion belonging to a higher degree of reality, which art strives towards, and of which we may catch glimpses in flashes of consciousness above the ordinary. But for materialism, a higher degree of reality is not countenanced. I think it would be absolutely inexplicable on the basis upon which materialism rests. There may be a below, but there cannot be an above. There can be no existing higher degree of reality. There can be no superior order behind the phenomenal world, nothing prior to it in its scale. For the universe must be a mindless product and body must be prior to mind. There can be no fault without phosphorus. Matter must be prior to function and use and sensation prior to meaning. To admit a higher order of reality behind no re reality is, in fact, to reverse the direction of materialism, for it is to affirm by an act of the mind what the senses by themselves do not directly show, but what, at the same time, the senses really indicate, and it is exactly in this that Plato puts the turning point of a man's soul, in this recognition of an existing higher order of reality that explains this obviously imperfect, suggestive world in which we live. If the universe be in man as a scale of reality, as well as man in the universe, then if a man gives an inferior explanation of the universe, it will react on himself. He will limit himself and remain inferior to his own potential being. He is then left nothing else to do but to study a dead material world outside him, out of which his own life and his mind accidentally come. If there be energies in us capable of seeking another direction, they will then necessarily find no goal. For if there be things of the spirit, if there be higher degrees of consciousness and realness within, then all those impulses which in their right development should separate man from the tyranny of outer life and create inner independence of soul through the realisation of these higher degrees within, will become fused with the things of outer life into one common outer influence, for having no inner goal, their goal will seem to lie outside him. The hypnotic power of outer life will then be increased. The outer will then tend to be felt fanatically, i.e. religiously, and that is perhaps why in this age of materialism men seem doomed to sacrifice themselves more and more to mass organisations, to war, to machines, to speed, to gigantism and ugliness of every kind, in order to get emotional satisfaction. Seen from this angle, the attitude of scientific materialism really increases man's inner weakness, which is always too great. In all that belongs to himself, in all that is necessary for the dawn of individuality, it renders him more and more impotent, giving him the illusion that he can gain absolute power over a dead material world. And with this increasing inner weakness, he seeks more and more to put himself under some dominating personality, to surrender his thinking, to cease to be a man at all. What paradox could be stranger? The emotional attitude belonging to materialism is necessarily quite different from that belonging to idealism. As materialists, we think we can lay bare the secrets of nature, and as often as not we assume the credit of being the actual creators of whatever processes we have discovered. It is extraordinary how a very superficial descriptive explanation satisfies us that we know. For example, by chemical analysis we can find out the quantitative composition of a substance. Vegetation is obviously green-blooded. Chlorophyll is its most important constituent. Man has red blood and hemoglobin is its chief element. We can find by chemical analysis that their structure is rather similar and that each contains so many atoms of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, etc. We tend then to assume that we have discovered what they are by discovering the quantity and kind of elementary constituent bricks in these substances. 
But their use and the idea behind these substances belong to quite a different order of thinking and this is what, as materialists, we tend to ignore. We ignore what they represent, what place they have and what part they played in a connected universe. We ignore quality, for as materialists we do not admit a connected or intelligent universe in which everything has its definite role or function. Comte actually said that quality was no positive entity, the most positive entity being quantity. But is not the meaning of a thing as a whole, its function and use, the part it plays in the life of man and in the life of the universe its most positive aspect? And is not the fact that, quantitatively speaking, different chemical structure transmits such an infinite variety of qualities, the greatest mystery of all? The most positive aspect of a thing is the thing as a whole. We never really explain or understand a thing by the mere reduction of it to its elementary parts, while ignoring its pattern qualities and uses and purposes when taken as a whole. Such a way of explaining a thing gives us a wrong sense of power, a conceit, a superficiality of standpoint, which seemed to me to light the very root of materialism. I remember my first contact with chemistry at school. Everything seemed to become amazingly simple. Everything was merely chemistry, merely different quantities and combinations of elementary particles. A living being was merely a combination of different quantities of atoms, of infinitely small bricks, of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, sulphur, nitrogen and phosphorus, certainly in vast and inconceivable quantities, but still nothing but atoms. Even a person whom one loved was nothing but a prodigious quantity of atoms. Explanations seem to be fascinatingly easy on this basis of quantities. Is not this the obsessing fascination of explaining the greater by the less, the root of all obsession? It seemed as if the secret of the universe had been handed over to me, particularly because at that time people in general seemed to be quite ignorant of chemistry. It was only when I began to ponder over the meaning of the periodic law of the elements, the law of the octave as the English chemist Newlands called it, whereby the same sort of elements repeat themselves at regular intervals, that I realised that something stood behind all these at atoms and behind all chemistry. There is law, there is order, which determine their action, their properties, their position, their affinities and relations. Behind these elementary particles stood another world, the world of law, order, form and principle, that connected all these particles together and made all chemical changes and relationships possible. But is, it is understandable how anyone who has not yet began to think can become intoxicated by the powers that science seems to put into his hands. It seems possible to explain everything, to know everything, to understand exactly why everything is what it is. And this first contact with science produces in some people an extraordinary contempt for and intolerance of anything like idealism, that is, of a world behind this visible world that explains this visible world. They cannot see that we cannot really know or understand or even explain anything simply through the method of science and that all our explanations are nothing but descriptions of processes that remain a mystery. The natural man of the 18th century writers and the carnal-minded or sensual man of the ancient writers is the outward-turned, sense-bound and sense-minded man. But we all have this natural man as a particular part of our being. Today, this side of human psychology is intensified by the marvels of science, whose general standpoint has reached the masses. Intellectually, we appear to have only what Paul called the mind of the flesh. And even if we vaguely believe in realities higher than those we can contact with our senses, the natural man in us haunts us with the idea that such higher realities, if they exist at all, will eventually be proved by some grand scientific demonstration or finally dismissed. 
But can we suppose that any demonstration of higher realities, I mean one that could somehow appeal to the senses, could ever take us off the sensual level of understanding? Nothing that can be demonstrated to the senses, no scientific discovery of any sort, no demonstration that can be proved to us, will ever lift us from that level of understanding. Why is this so? Perhaps we have never really considered the question. If there be potential degrees of higher reality within us, nothing coming from this side of the senses will alone open them. We do not understand this easily. Yet, is it not obvious that man himself is not changed by discoveries in phenomena? No matter how far we investigate the minute side of the phenomenal world, we will never escape from materialism, however subtly it may be presented. We can never prove, discover or realise mind through sense. An extraordinary discovery such as that of wireless telegraphy does not change us in ourselves in the slightest degree. We merely get used to it and expect more. The quality of our consciousness undergoes not the slightest change. A sense of the miraculous does not leaven it. In fact, the contrary happens. We become more blind, more bored, more sure. If a change in consciousness is possible, it does not seem possible that it can come from the phenomenal side. Suppose, even, it was possible to prove to the senses the existence of a deity. What would be the result? Suppose a deity could be demonstrated. It would mean that all sides of things which the inner spirit of man must search after and seek to apprehend individually as self-revealed and self-realised truth will become a matter of sensory and general evidence. Were a divinity to appear in the sky, the whole inner construction of man would be violated and rendered sterile. Man would be coerced through his senses in just what belongs to his highest and most individual issues. The deepest theme in the drama of invisible and visible would be anticipated in the most wretched way and our situation would be far more intolerable than it is. From this angle we can perhaps see why all arguments in favour of higher intelligence that reach out, out ultimately to external sensory proofs as Paley's argument from design, the alleged existence of spirits, proof by external miracles and magic, when brought too close to us as evidence, profoundly repel us. Outer cannot coerce inner. Indeed, in all such matters, outer proof of the marvellous does not help us. The miracles of the modern world in physical science have not helped us to reach deeper values. An increase in the range of known or expected phenomena obviously does not awaken man's spirit. Life is sufficiently miraculous already, only we do not notice it. If we catch a glimpse of its mystery, we border momentarily on new emotions and thoughts, but this comes from within as a momentary individual awakening of the spirit. Eckhart says that we are at fault as long as we see God in what is outside us. It is not a matter of sense or of sensory evidence or of collective demonstration. He is not the prodigious and terrifying whirlwind, nor earthquake, nor fire. As long as we have this external view, a hindrance lies in ourselves, and we fail to understand something of tremendous importance. Why is this so? Apparently, we cannot begin from outer proof, from the phenomenal side. Through our senses, we cannot reach a necessary place of understanding, though, whether we know it or not, our sense-mindedness is always trying to do so. Where creature stops, there God begins. All the liberating inner truth and vision that we need, apart from outer truth and facts about things, is, Eckhart says, native within us. It is an internal matter to be realised first as being in us, yet it is far more difficult to understand what this means than we imagine. For we are born and nurtured in sensation, and so cannot help thinking sensually. Sensation, the sensory, is our mother, and she is very difficult to overcome. Our incest with matter is universal. 
The most important and convincing evidence for us remains the outward evidence of the senses. We see our salvation nine in that kind of truth and therefore nowadays in some great discovery and some fresh facts. We cannot comprehend the psychological significance of such a statement as, from Romans 8.24, We are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopeth for that which he seeth? One point then about materialism as regards its limiting effect upon man would seem to lie in the attitude it takes towards the existence of higher degrees of reality. Man's reason is taken to be capable of attaining to a complete knowledge of the laws and the nature of all things. His consciousness, while it is capable of including more and more facts, is not regarded as capable of attaining a new quality. Higher degrees of consciousness and higher degrees of truth and entirely new forms of experience are excluded. We see then that such a view certainly does not include scow. Scow must necessarily imply an above and a below, a higher and a lower, and also a special way of connecting things on different levels of reality. Materialism, having no sense of scow, cannot therefore admit either that which is greater than man or that which is greater in man. But is the sole mode of experiencing or understanding life by way of the method of science? Is not science merely one mode of experience? And are we to believe that the quality of our ordinary consciousness is so fine that further states of consciousness are inconceivable? Are not further states of consciousness most likely to be the key to the understanding of the complexities and contradictions that have arisen in the realm of physics? The synthetic power belonging to our ordinary consciousness may well be of such a kind that it is unable to assimilate into a whole the various separate findings of scientific research. If we argue in this way, it would mean that scientific materialism is limiting to the psychological development of man simply because it takes the consciousness of man for granted and therefore does not concern itself with problems as to how man can reach a higher state of development in himself, by what methods, or what kind of knowledge, work, ideas, efforts and attitudes. With all this latter we see at once that what is usually called religion has always, on its inner side, concerned itself. The so-called gap between science and religion seems to lie exactly at this point. Man cannot understand more because he is in a state of inner disorganisation. The quality of his consciousness is too separate and coarse, yet he starts out in his investigations of the universe without any idea that he will be unable to penetrate beyond a certain point because he himself is an unsuitable instrument for this purpose. He thinks only that he is limited by a lack of scientific instruments of sufficient precision or by a lack of data. He thinks, therefore, outwards and strives only to overcome the outward difficulties. All that ancient religion and philosophy concerned itself with and all that great art has reached after will seem to him to have no possible connection with the difficulties he experiences in attaining final knowledge and ultimate truth. The finer qualities of consciousness and the new meaning and interpretations that art and religion have sought to reach will not seem to be of any importance to him, nor will he suspect that the inevitable contradictions that he is bound to find awaiting him at the end of his investigations result from the quality of his own consciousness and his own inner disorganisation. For Plato, the world is not only our sensation of it, as it must be if man is merely in the world. The world is also in man, so man can know from within as well as from without. The ideas behind all discernible reality are touched by man through the existence or in him of innate notions. These innate notions in the soul of man has as their true object the ideas which are the archetypes behind all temporal manifestation. So, while our knowledge is developed by worldly experience, it contains elements which are not derived from experience. In its contact with the sensible world, which contains imperfect 
representations of the eternal ideas, the soul is awakened in greater or less degree to an awareness of the ideas themselves. This awareness comes not from the side of the senses, but internally from the side of the mind. The soul recollects the ideas through perceiving the manifold objects of nature into which the ideas are reflected. The soul stands between the sensible world and the world of ideas, between two orders of reality, and becoming aware of this, she takes from the world of sensible objects all those impressions which remind her of a higher order of reality, not giving to sensible nature that which does not belong to it, but extracting from it that which belongs to an order above it. So a whole mode of experience in temporal life and gaining impressions becomes quite different from the mode of existence belonging to the soul that is glued to the senses and sees all as outside her, attributing the first causal principle to physical nature itself. For the awakened soul, all is really within. The real world is within and is only appre apprehensible within. And a man whose soul has reached this position is no longer natural or sensual man, although all that sense reveals to him is immeasurably intensified. He sees clearly with increasing clearness because he has become a meeting point of two worlds, one reached within and through himself and the other reached without and through his senses. How are visible objects representations of ideas? How do the eternal ideas enter the three-dimensional world in passing time? Plato suggests that they enter through the most minute, through the dimensionless. It is evident, says Plato, that generation takes place whenever a principle, archi, originating principle, attains to the second dimension and coming as far as the third arrives at such a state as to become an object of sensation, end quote, laws 894a. This seems to mean that he thought that the higher world enters the known world through its finest divisions. But it must be clearly understood that Plato's suggestion concerning the source of generation is not a refined materialism aided by a theory of dimensions. Originating cause is for him quite distinct from any matter that we can reach externally through scientific research. Idea enters into manifestation through what, for our sense perception, is dimensionless. Let us conceive an illustration. Idea enters a seed. The seed is the elementary material constituent or third term. Between the first term, idea, and the third term, seed, there grows up flower, animal or child as second term. Only in one sense is the seed cause. The seed is fertile because of the first term, idea, which is nahil, nothing, dimensionless, invisible in the phenomenal world. If the material organisation of the seed be faulty, the idea to which it is conjoined will be unable to manifest itself in space and pass in time rightly. The spermatic power is really in the idea rather than in the seed and flows as a current through the seed when the right conditions for nurture exist. Yet, thinking naturally, we see the full cause of a flower or an animal or child in the seed alone, in the minute speck of organised matter. And in the case of sterile hybrids, we think rather of a state of the seed than of the confounding of two distinct ideas, each of which can only manifest itself in an appropriate seed. In consequence of the quality of our consciousness, which gives us an outward direction, we cannot see ourselves distinctly. We take the effects of outer life upon us as ourselves. We can scarcely discern our states and moods apart from what appear to be their outside causes. Governed by our senses, reality appears to be outside us. Sensually, we do not realise the invisibility of ourselves and others, for this is not a matter of perceptible consciousness. Our outwardness prevents our reaching of inner harmony. There is nothing in ourselves so much more real than it is capable of isolating us from the continual effects of the world that is entering via sense. We are controlled by the sense-given scene, and so we are outside ourselves. But we imagine that we are controlled by our reason and set firmly in ourselves. 
Speaking of the conditions of higher consciousness, Ospensky remarks that it is necessary that the centre of gravity of everything shall lie for man in his inner world, in self-consciousness, and not in the outer world at all. Tertium Organum, page 331. He is speaking here of self-consciousness as the full consciousness of I, of a state of consciousness in which the centre of gravity of our being, that is I, is in ourselves. With our present consciousness we are, as it were, fused with the world and continually distracted by its changes. And the form of our thought, which is based upon what the senses show us, is natural, that is, it follows the world of sense and passes in time and is grounded in the evidence of things seen. To get the centre of gravity of our being into ourselves, to become possessed of an eternal sense of I, in place of the continual reactions of the moment to which we say I, another reality of all things in general is necessary. Our natural concepts are not sufficient to change the quality of consciousness or to get the centre of gravity of our being into ourselves. Man must not only overcome the sensual view of life by theoretical thinking, but he must look within, away from the senses, and become an object of study to himself. And he must get beyond merely sensible knowledge and even rational knowledge. Eckhart observes that there are three kinds of knowledge. The first is sensible, the second is rational and a great deal higher. The third corresponds to a higher power of the soul, which knows no yesterday or today or tomorrow. Eckhart is referring to a phrase used by Paul. Pray that ye may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the height, breadth, length and depth. He is pointing to a state of consciousness where time, as we know it, vanishes and there is no yesterday or tomorrow. Not only does a change in the sense of I belong to a higher quality of consciousness, but the natural concept of time derived from our sensory contact with the world disappears and a new knowledge or sense of time takes its place. What higher mathematics teaches theoretically in relation to dimensions is perceived by direct cognition. From this point of view, higher mathematics lies in between the understanding belonging to our ordinary consciousness and the understanding belonging to a higher level of consciousness. That is how I understand Plato's view that numbers differ from ideas and occupy the interval between ideas and sensible objects. The ideas belong to a higher degree of reality than do sensible objects, and in between come numbers. But we must understand that to arrive theoretically at the conclusion that the world is four-dimensional is quite different from the realisation of it through an actual change in the time sense. We have considered three of the factors limiting to the development of consciousness. First, the question of our sensualism and the necessity for overcoming the sensory and literal point of view with which the attitude of materialism is connected. Second, the need for change in the sense of I. Third, the need for a new understanding of time. The fourth factor relates to the quality of our love. Let us touch on that briefly before continuing the subject of levels of consciousness. Our love is little else than self-love. The more we study what self-love is, the more does it become apparent that it puts paradoxically, the centre of gravity of our being outside ourselves. Or, putting the matter in the reverse way, because the centre of gravity is outside ourselves, we only know, broadly speaking, self-love. Self-love always requires audience, either imagined or actual. Perhaps the simplest way to begin to understand the nature of self-love is to study it from the side of falsity of action. Whatever we do from self-love, we do in a false way, from a conceit, from the standpoint of producing some impression. We are not really doing what we are doing. We are not doing it from ourselves, but from a curious relationship of ourselves to others, or to the idea of others and ourselves. The great writers on self-love often take the subject back to the central point of attack in Christian psychology, to the Pharisee in us who does all things to be seen of men. The criticism, I suggest, is directed against the lack of any real psychological starting point within ourselves. 
We probably take this Pharisee too concretely, imagining we know the kind of people to whom the term can very well be referred. I will take it as referring to a difficulty that exists in everyone, and one that is a feature of our form of consciousness. We have no real I, we have no real self-consciousness. Our love of self is not love of anything real, so we cannot act from anything real in ourselves, but only from a continual, mirror-like process within us, which is not self-initiated, but automatic. So that, in considering what puts the centre of gravity outside ourselves, we have not only seen the factor due to the senses turning us outwards, making us see all as lying outside us, but also the emotional factor of the self-love. In Indian thought, bondage to Maya is, from one angle, bondage to the surrounding objects of sense. Not only our passion to possess objects is meant, but that everything outside us affects us or has power over us. We are continually distracted, just as a dog is distracted by everything he sees, hears or smells. The tumult of sense impressions, the riot of thoughts, the surgings of emotions and imagination, the throngings of desires have nothing central between them to steady them. Between them, which is pouring in from outside through the senses, and that which is going on within, nothing permanent intervenes to subject all these random activities to order, to bring them into alignment and produce a point of consciousness between inner and outer. The self-love disports itself in this chaos, glancing at itself in the mirror of every activity. Speaking of the chaotic inner state of man, Ospensky remarks that the first aim that an individual can have, as regards his own development, is to create in himself a permanent I, to protect himself from continual strivings, moods and desires which sway him now in one direction and now in another. A new model of the universe, page 244. But we must clearly grasp that such a state would mean a new state of the individual. It would mean a new quality of consciousness. It would mean the attainment of a higher degree of reality within. Such a permanent eye could not be a derivative of the self-love, which is changing its direction every moment, trying on every costume, as it were, and admiring itself in every possible pose. For everything relating to the self-love and the passion for approval and self-approval can have no stability in itself. The creation of a permanent eye must take place somewhere beyond the sphere of self-love, it must be brought into existence through a series of acts which cannot be initiated by self-love and so cannot start from the admiration of oneself. And for this reason many things are necessary before such acts can be self-initiated. The whole standpoint must change. The standpoint of materialism or sensualism cannot provide the right basis from which to start. Only the recognition that there are higher degrees of reality and the emotions that such a recognition can rouse, can begin to give the right starting point. For such emotions do not lie in the sphere of the self-love. In the Christian psychological system, many interesting things are said about love of neighbour, which are usually taken in a sentimental way, that is, from the side of the self-love. But the conscious discrimination of one's neighbour implies an actual development of consciousness. The quality of our ordinary love is so coloured by self-love that we are unable to feel the real existence of others, to feel them save momentarily. They are little more than associations with our self-love. In connection with this, Swedenborg says that our self-love demands as its main object a favourable reflection of ourselves in others. That is its goal. If we believe this reflection exists, we feel joy. This joy changes to dislike, self-pity or hate once we imagine the reflection is unfavourable. This is our ordinary love. It cannot become different, save momentarily, because the quality of our consciousness makes this impossible. To see another person, apart from our subjective notions and images, to realise another person's actual objective existence is exactly one of those momentary and genuine experiences which gives us hints of further possible states of consciousness. For then, during one moment, we awaken to entirely new and wonderful forms of experience. 
But falling back, we forget them because an inferior level of consciousness cannot reproduce the experiences belonging to a higher level. It is not so much that we forget, but cannot remember. I will connect the self-love with a definite psychological direction. The old conception of two paths that man can follow, as represented originally in the ancient Pythagorean why, is usually interpreted as referring to virtue and vice as conventionally understood according to period and local custom. Where the Samian Y directs thy steps to run, do virtues narrow, steep and broadway vice to shun. Quote from Dryden. This is the superficial explanation, but it may have originally referred to two possible paths in life, one real and one sham. Along the sham direction, let us imagine there lies the great spectacle of life, with all its honours and rewards. Its motive power is the gratified and ungratified self-love, its governing fear the loss of reputation. Along this path we all seek in some form or another audience. Usually we seek open approval. Connected with it is a very remarkable perpetual motion machine. The great are flattered by the homage of their inferiors and the inferiors are flattered by the recognition of the great. Thus the machinery turns unceasingly in this mutual self-satisfaction. Bernard de Mandeville saw in this machinery the driving force of every form of society. He distinguished this aspect of self-love as self-liking. It is the passion of self-liking, he says, which is generated in children in the nursery by the chorus of praise which surrounds them. That is not only the foundation of all society, but it is the source of honour and shame through which the appetites of people are held in check, and men and women are made virtuous, though not in any real sense. Through the passion of self-liking, people may imitate all the virtues of the Christian life. He said indeed that there are no Christians, which rouse the greatest indignation. Along this sham path, life is chiefly a dressing up, an emptiness, a make-believe, in which we seek to be like something, rather than really to be something. In this sense, then, no one is really doing what he appears to be doing, and nothing is what it pretends to be. Everything is governed by the complicated reactions of the gratified, the wounded or the expectant self-love. Thus, no one is pure in heart, that is, the emotions are not real. The general cause is that no one has created himself, no one has real existence in himself. We only attain to a fictitious self-existence, and if we are frank with ourselves, we know that we feel empty or locked in. We do not know what to do. Through the incessant mirror action of the self-love, we are always turned outward, towards audience, away from the direction of self-existence. So, we are turned outwards not only by our senses and sense-mindedness, which can be said to belong to our natural constitution, but also by the infinite psychological ramifications of our self-love. When the self-love is wounded, or when we feel our reputation is damaged or lost, we feel depreciated, inferior or annihilated. Actually, such a state of affairs might be regarded as a starting point for something new, but in life this does not happen. The starting point for some entirely new state of oneself, above what life produces, can never lie along the direction of what is generally approved or applauded, for it will then only administer to the self-love, which is the point of danger. For nothing, says Swedenborg, can produce such a brilliant effect upon oneself as the fully gratified self-love. For its delight, he says, reaches to every fibre of the body and is felt far more intensely than is the gratification of any of the physical appetites. So also are the effects of wounded self-love equally intense. Swedenborg defines the first step beyond self-love as the love of uses. Anyone who can be simple enough to take real pleasure in what he does and be genuinely interested in what he works at obviously moves a step beyond self-love. We must imagine a range of conscious experience lying above that which we ordinarily know. Intervening between it and what we ordinarily know is a discontinuity, a gap. 
We cannot bridge this gap save through lending ourselves to ideas, views and ways of taking things that ultimately belong to the higher range of conscious experience. Remaining sensual, the gap is not bridged, taking things in the ordinary way, retaining our ordinary views and natural ideas, we never attain the potential in us. All systems of religion have this attainment in view, but not understanding the doctrine of potentiality, which regards man as a seed, we take all that we class as religion in a moral way, as something merely urging us to be good. And the more obscure side of religion, the hints that belong to its internal meaning and esoteric side, we usually entirely ignore or contemplate with idle curiosity. We certainly see no science in that. But if there be a higher reality of oneself, there must be an actual science of that higher reality of oneself. A science higher than any we know, and one which will comprehend in itself all the ordinary forms of knowing, such as belong to philosophy, art and the sciences. And having this view in mind, that there is a higher science of man, we can perceive that observation of the following kind probably finds its place just in this higher science. Bohm said that we could come into a new reality of our being and perceive everything in a new relation. Quote, if we can stand still from self-thinking and self-willing and stop the will of imagination and the senses. End quote. These are plain psychological instructions, but in what sense psychological? Not as we understand psychology today. For what possible meaning can they have for us if we deny the possibility of any qualitative change to man. If there be no higher reality, there is no sense in such instructions, no psychological meaning. And if to obtain a higher reality of oneself, the centre of gravity of one's being must be in oneself, then this qualitative change in being will clearly remain impossible as long as we are turned only outwards. The centre of gravity of oneself must not lie outside through the action of self-love and the senses. It must not lie outwards in this foreign world, which we can never directly reach, but within, in this invisibility that is the beginning of oneself, and can become something, and through which we can reach neighbour. And for this to happen, a qualitative change of standpoint is necessary, and a willingness which starts from a conviction that there is something else that is essential for us. For we can only begin from our own willingness and our own conviction. I believe that as long as we think of that the world, as displayed to our senses, contains all that we need and holds the key to our happiness, then we must always go in the wrong direction. We must overcome that degree of materialism to begin with, that kind of sensual understanding, and with it also overcome the effect of all those evidences in which the sensual man within us finds so much complacent comfort as, for example, in the outward solidarity of a religious or a political movement, or in the increase of its organised and outward form. We must understand that we can rest upon no proof such as the sensual understanding will seek and accept. The extraordinary confusion that arises when we confound the truth of ideas with the truth of the senses must disappear. We can no longer say that we will believe, provided we have the proof, or that we cannot believe because there is no proof. A man's understanding must not stop at that point where things can no longer be satisfactorily demonstrated and proved to everyone. We have comprehension far above the sensory field and experiences quite apart from it. Faith and belief belong to orders of understanding quite distinct from sensual understanding and sensory proof. The greatest initial barrier of all lies is the inability to distinguish between the truth of ideas and the truth of sense. It is a confounding of two orders, of what belongs to the inner man and what belongs to the outer man, and until it is passed the inner life is rendered sterile because it cannot receive food. Even when a man reads or hears about truth belonging to ideas, he holds it off by arguing that no one really knows or that it cannot be proved. Yet the outward turn inside of us must first taste life in full, seeing the solution of all things as lying without. As the prodigal son, it must go out into life and experience, tasting from every cup, avoiding, if it can, 
the cup of bitterness. As prodigal sons, we must first go further and further from source until there awakens in us, earlier or later, fleeting realisations that the direct approach to outer life cannot give us what we are looking for. The sensual man thinks of the outer as the most familiar and easy, the most satisfying and real, and the most easily reached. Does it not come to be the most foreign and most incomprehensible, and in the long run, the most unsatisfying? Can you ever directly understand or possess or reach even the simplest objects lying in it? Certainly you will know you cannot if you already know your invisibility. Karl Barth says, Men suffer because, bearing within them an invisible world, they find this unobservable inner world met by the tangible, foreign, other, outer world, desperately visible, dislocated, its fragments jostling one another, yet mightily powerful and strangely menacing and hostile. That's from Commentary on Romans, page 306. We are indeed such a desperately foreign world in such a strange land that we may well ask ourselves how it has ever been possible to believe that we have been mechanically evolved through countless millions of years solely in order to be directly in it and of it. If the doctrine of potentiality is true and man is incomplete but capable of reaching the further states of himself, any psychological system that does not take these possibilities into consideration must be inadequate. Actually, it must be negative in character. It will not be enough to take known life alone. A positive psychological system, as that inherent in Christianity, must teach that man can be different and be based upon the view, the actual knowledge, that man is capable of a very definite kind of development that mere response to known life does not give and that some definite transformation can take place in him. The ideas belonging to such a system will not, of course, be understandable in any ordinary way. They will not be about the phenomenal world, about matters of sense, about the third term. Nor will such ideas be verifiable through historical considerations which are of minor importance. One does not prove the truth of an idea by demonstrating that it's found or lived. The evidence of its truth can only lie in a man's own experience of it when he enters into him. Such ideas cannot be compared to ordinary scientific ideas. We shall not find them in books on the physical nature of the universe, and unless we can distinguish between ideas of this kind and ordinary or scientific ideas, we will never be able to give them any germinating place in our mind, or perhaps never even grasp what they refer to. <laughs>